Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. This is Stowe Bishop, joined, as always, by Ryan McMakin, and we have a special guest for this week's show, senior editor for the Mises Wire, Mr. Bill Anderson, a national champion track star at the University of Tennessee. So, you know, we only like winners here, so, so love that as well. And he's got a, a fun article on the wire uh, this week, uh, David French gets to sit with the cool kids at the New York Times lunch table. And one of our favorite topics, of course, is making fun of the pundits that never have to th say they're sorry for all of the disastrous things that they have promoted and propagandized throughout their career. So we thought we would take advantage of this article to bring on Bill to the show. So Bill, how are you doing today on this Radio Rothbard uh, episode? Doing well and, and anxiously waiting uh, whatever it is we're gonna do today. Excellent, and you will be receiving soon one of these great Radio Rothbard mugs, which I know our listeners are uh, very familiar with at this point. They're flying off the shelves. You can get yours at Mises.org slash Rothmug. There goes my shameless advertising for the show. But so, Bill, um, let's talk a little bit about Mr. David French, who in many ways has come to sort of uh, embody a certain type of pundit uh, within the, uh, I don't know, they, 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 he likes to call himself a classical liberal. We would disagree with some of that. Uh, but part of the, the sort of punditry class that the New York Times and outlets like that, The Atlantic, I think, is another one of the, the fine publications where he sees his byline quite frequently, where they are kind of propped up and held up as the voice of opposition a little bit from their standard punditry fare, but really kind of serve as helping frame the discussion where anyone outside of their ideological grounds is on the, the radical extreme, the dangerous crowd. And so uh, to begin, can you just talk a little bit about your article on the Mises Wire and uh, what inspired you to, to take your pen to Mr. David French? Well, you know, I've been reading him for several years. And, um, uh, you know, I, I first remember when he was at National Review and then the Dispatch, and I noticed that there were a lot of, he was kind of changing. What happened, there were two three things that happened. Once was, one was the election of Donald Trump. And so his over-the-top reaction that, you know, we have to oppose everything this guy does no matter what, we just, you know, we have to be part of this resistance or whatever. And so that was the first part. And, you know, the attacks, of not on, just on Trump, but anybody who supported him. All right, that was the first thing. But the second thing was his reaction, not simply to, to the spread of COVID, but his reaction to all of the restrictions being placed upon people, you know, the lockdowns, and especially as it related to churches and, you know, kind of houses of worship, where he and a number of others took up this uh, mantle of we are, uh, we are the spokesman for love your neighbor. The idea, if you are not masking, if you are not doing exactly what Anthony Fauci tells you to do, and granted, this week he could be telling you to do 180 degrees of what he told you to do last week. But if you are not following, you know, Anthony Fauci, you do not love your neighbor. And so this whole love your neighbor thing started coming out to the point where it got really irritating. I mean, and the guy was starting to really irritate me. Then he, then he announces he's going to the New York Times and you know this is my dream job and and the like and so uh, you know and I started then reading some other things um, I do uh, read Rod Dreher's column and and he had some stuff on David French and read some other columns by some evangelicals some thoughtful ones too these guys you know this was not the alt-right and the like and so uh, you know, I've watched him go down the certain road. You know, if you don't support full military uh, 
uh, Vietnamization of uh, Ukraine, which is really what we're looking at. This is Vietnamization. Uh, and, you know, and I'm, one, I'm one of the people old enough to remember Vietnamization the first time since I had a draft, low draft number and a draft card that said 1A. So, you know, I remember that quite well. But his reaction was, you know, if you're not totally all in, and if you don't think that the president is the most valorous, wonderful person in the world, I'm talking about the president of Ukraine, then, uh, you know, you want lots of people to die and, you know, you're not loving your neighbor and that kind of thing. And so, um, and I've watched his columns and it finally dawned on me what's going on is that he comes to the New York Times very much as the guy, hey, I'm the refugee from the religious right. And let me tell you about these. These are terrible people. These are awful people. And let me tell you about them. And uh, um, and so, you know, you get, and, and, and it dawned on me, the analogy was sitting with the cool kids at lunch. That, um, and, and where I got that from was years ago, this is, my first job out of college, so this is uh, 1976, and we're talking 47 years ago. And um, uh, he, uh, um, and, and if you, a lot of times we'd be covering stories that the national reporters were covering. And so you would see the network people, the New York Times people, all that kind of sitting in the back. They were either the back of the bus if you were on a bus or if you were in some kind of gathering. And every once in a while, they would ask you something, uh, whatever. And, you know, you were supposed to just jump. And, oh, my God. So, you know, so-and-so from the New York Times has just asked me to uh, uh, show them where the bathroom was or something. You know, it just... and. You know, things like this. And it dawned on me, you know, my God, this is like high school again. You know, this is, uh, now I went to private all boys high school, so we had our own version of the cool kids. But this is, you know, everything that you see on Fast Times at Ridge, Ridgemont High or anything else. I mean, this was the same thing playing all over again. And, you know, look, that's how Washington, D.C. is, right? You know, who's up this week, who's down, that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's all the same kind of drama. And so now, you know, after years, after sitting on the outskirts, David French is now allowed to walk into the inner sanctum. And, uh, you know, and, and he doesn't quite have the cool kids button on yet. I'm sure that's coming, though. But, yeah. It- One, and you mentioned... You mentioned him as a kind of a refugee from the religious right, and it is worth noting a little bit about his background here. Um, born actually Opelika, Alabama, uh, right down the road from uh, Auburn, uh, but he, uh, uh, you know, Harvard trained, spent some time in the military. Um, I love his old photos because he's very much kind of a chinless wonder, which you know has, is a common in itself. Uh, but you know, his he kind of broke out by kind of defending religious freedom. Um, you know, I think it was 2017, uh, he was very vocal about the, um, you know, pushing back against gay marriage, the normalization of sort of the, the LGBTQ plus, et cetera, agenda out there, um, was president of, uh, the foundation for individual rights or in education, the, the fire organization, which, which does some good work here and there. Um, and yet here now he is very clearly backtracking on, on all of this sort of stuff, but also he, he's often kind of promoted using his background as an attorney to defend a lot of these institutions. And Ryan, as someone who knows all about sitting at the cool kids table, um, you know, I, I, th- this, this role of being sort of the, the, uh, the defender of the, the very serious, very uh, non-political, uh, uh, dispassionate, fine folks um, you know, managing our, our federal investigations and our, uh, our, our Department of Justice heads. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. You know, this is precisely the sort of stuff that the conservative, the intellectual conservative class kind of played that role in for, for quite a long time. And it's exactly there that we are, we are seeing the rollback there. And uh, Ryan, obviously, you know, with, with the, 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 the shadow of yet another Trump indictment, um, you know, this, this is one of those areas that I, I think really is what's driving people like David French crazy. They are seeking out the cool kids tables of the New York Times and places like that because the sort of people that he used to imagine himself 
a leader of, right? You know, he, he had the considered running for president himself in 2016 at the uh, the pleading of Bill Kristol, which is one of the biggest red flags out there. Um, you know, we, we've seen the, the complete decay of faith in these institutions, which is one of the most positive trends of, of recent years. Um, and I, I think being a propagandist for that state is one of the his, his biggest roles that he's playing right yeah. now. Well, we, the conservative movement has always had lots of these guys, and they're always pushed to the front as the allegedly the, the main spokesman. Now, of course, conservatives in general, the regime tolerates them and can usually find someone among them they like because conservatives are generally terrible on foreign policy, and they, they agree with CIA spying. They agree with endless wars and all that stuff. They might disagree on maybe some of the details, but fundamentally, the... Uh, the ideal conservative government is something about what you had with, say, George W. Bush in about, say, the year 2006 or so. Massive welfare expansion, numerous wars, um, uh, the destruction of civil liberties in the, in the name of uh, fighting uh, the international enemy, the axis of evil and all that stuff. So you can see why the New York Times, as long as they can find that sort of person, that, of course, they can tolerate that person making some social commentary and, and uh, being a little non-left around the edges. And as long as they also take a very, uh, a tone that seems very calm and civilized, uh, and uh, they talk down to the more populist uh, areas of the conservative movement, then that all works to the left's advantage as well. So think of someone like George Will. Uh, think of someone like David Brooks. These people always reliably support more government intervention in your life. Um, they've never really opposed uh, the regime at its core in any way. They express some mild misgivings about whatever latest horrible thing the regime is doing. And, oh, but by the way, I don't care for these excesses uh, among some oh, on yeah. the left. That's basically what their whole shtick amounts to. And David French is just filling, he's the new George Will, he's the new David Brooks. Yeah, except he's not as good a writer as George Will. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. I, and I think, I, Ryan, I think you've, you've hit it pretty well. And here's the thing, I mean, now, David... Uh, went to uh, Lips, David Lipscomb, which is uh, Church of Christ, okay? And so he was brought up in Church of Christ, which uh, was a little bit of a kind of more of a separatist type thing. But for years, he went to uh, Christ Community Church in Franklin, which was in my old denomination, the Presbyterian Church in America. And, um, and so, you know, I reliably know his theology where you know where he's coming from and the like and uh he he left christ community and he went to a, a black church called victory temple and to me i mean i don't know i mean i've I, I have to be careful here because, you know, I'm when I married Paulette, you know, I married into, you know, an African American family. I um you know, and my brother in law was a pastor of Church of God in Christ and so I joined and lo and behold they made me a trustee and which is why I had to postpone the meeting time later because I had to go count the money this morning and uh and a deacon. And so uh but I mean, I joined mate, you know, because really it's family members, and and I was okay with you know the theology and and the like. But to me, doing some of the stuff he does is more what we would call the virtue signaling. Hey, everybody, I'm I'm in a black church now, and you know, and and you know you're free to go wherever you want to go. I don't you know, and if the people want to accept them there, that is fine. Uh, you know, everybody's, I've never had an issue myself, you know, where I go, but you've got to be careful with that. You know, you have to be careful signaling to the rest of the world that, hey, I, you know, I'm going with these folks now and uh, that, you know, that that makes me something special, you know, that obviously the taint of racism can't possibly be around me because, well, look, you know, look at this. And, you know, you just, you, you kind of roll your eyes with it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not my business where he goes to church, but when somebody starts 
doing things that are that really smack of virtue signaling, and they want you to know about this. And at that point, you know, you start getting a little more suspicious. Of, okay, what else is going on here? Well, that holier than thou attitude is, is definitely, I think, a, a consistent tone um, of his work. And actually, well, one of the podcasts that I, I listen to on occasion is kind of get the other side of things. Um, the, the fifth column, which has a few uh, a reason associated folks um, within it. You know, whenever he's a guest, I, I tune in just to kind of kind of get a little bit of taste to, to just remind myself on exactly why I do not like David Frenchism, um, and he never never serves to, to disappoint. Um, within that, but I, he, had a, he had a comment recently how that the most dangerous extremists in America today are uh, a certain type of, of American Christian who is very upset about the kind of the, the liberal shift in the country, um, you know, who, who are, you know, genuinely uh, a big fans of the president. And it's just like looking around, you know, for, for, for someone whose entire career was kind of built on this sort of cultural conservative foundation. Again, he's already backtracked on, on you know, I, I don't know if that's, that was required to, to get in the building um, before your key card works at, at the New York Times, but, but backtracking on a lot of these, these views that he had no problem putting his name to, you know, 2017. I mean, this wasn't, you know, this, was, this wasn't you know, 2002 when he was supporting the, the Iraq war and you know, pumping the war drums there. He's never had to apologize for those views. It, it's, it's these sort of viewpoints that he is very quick to condemn a lot of people who, you know, hold views that were completely, were, were seen as the mainstream um, not that long ago. And again, kind of serving that role of continually sort of pushing that, that index card of allowable opinion, I have to pay Tom Woods some smackers for using that line, but you know, that's sort of the role that these plays, uh, people play within the in intellectual uh, environment is, is gatekeeping on the right of, of what is respectable. And again, historically, I mean, and, and the, the one good thing I perhaps about this is that the National Review used to be very good at this, right? You know, the, you know we had a, an episode a few, few weeks ago about um, the way that the National Review purged people like Murray Rothbard and Pat Buchanan and, and the Birchers and, and folks like that out of the movement. You know, they were very successful once upon a time, given the, the unique, um, and, you know, the, the, the difference of the media landscape there, right? You know, there, there weren't a lot of, it was a lot harder to, uh, to, to create a challenger to the National Review. Whereas some of these side projects, you know, I, I know the dispatch still makes enough money for, for Jenna Goldberg to, to draw a salary. He, he, he can't afford a pair of pants. Uh, which is always one of my favorite Trump all insults of all time um, during the 2016 campaign. Um, and yet the relevance that he has, I mean, e even, even, you know, I, I think, you know, places like, like AEI, um, they're not holding up David French as sort of the proper embodiment of, of old conservatism. I mean, they'll, they'll still prop up Liz Cheney, but even French's standing within that orbit um, you know, seem, seems to be lacking. And again, the, the inability for that historic dynamic of shaping the 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 proper analysis, you know that 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 you know conservatives of note follow, um, that seems to be breaking down. Where you know, David French's only audience seems to be, uh, you know, a, a a liberal audience, or increasingly oh, yeah. the sort of of cosmopolitan libertarian audience, well, um, like the Reason Crowd. No, and yeah, but there's also an element within what I would call at least semi-conservative evangelicalism as well. The Christianity mm -hmm. Today Today crowd, Russell Moore. Um, people like Beth Moore. Um, I've got friends where, you know, I taught for six years at Covenant College, which is Presbyterian Church in America College. And, and you know, they hold the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, you know, the whole nine yards there and, and the like. But they all like David French. And I'll tell you why. is because, see, with David French, there is the aura of respectability that... Um, if there's one thing you can say about a lot of, especially fundamentalism, and whether they went, you know, they you know had places like Bob Jones University or um, now Liberty University as well, that they were not respectable. Okay, and 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 granted that, I mean. I was never part of of them. I, you know, I understood them. I understood the independent Baptist movement. There was a lot about it that I did not like, um, and whatnot. But the 
there is this issue of respectability. How do you look respectable to people who are not Christians, who are not in our orbit, but we would still like to be able to be seen as respectable to them? And there has always been that element there. And Christianity today, I think, has always tried to appeal to that. And, um, and you know, and I, I remember back in, I think, in 2014 when Liz... Uh, uh, let's see, Tish Harrison Warren, who now also has a column in the New York Times, and she wrote an article for CT called uh, The Wrong Kind of Christian, and it was about how she was involved in InterVarsity Fellowship and that Vanderbilt kicked them and all these other Christian groups off campus. Uh, and, of course, you know me being a University of Tennessee uh, former athlete and graduate, I'd I believe that Vandy has no right even to exist, and much less ever have the right to beat us in football. But um, but the the thing about it I thought was interesting was that here she says talks about this, and yet she never seemed to have learned anything from it. And she still is, you know, there's that element of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, um, of which I was part of when I was in college 50 years ago. And they want to be respectable, okay? And there are some aspects of fundamentalist Christianity, especially the area of dispensationalism, stuff that's not particularly respectable. If you're uh, Pentecostal, you're definitely never going to sit with the cool kids at the table. And there's always, there's been this desire to be seen as respectable. You see it with uh, Calvin University over the years and elsewhere. And so there's that element there. And I understand that element because that was, to a certain extent, I was most associated with them. And, um, but I was always considered a little too conservative, whatnot. And, uh, you know, one time I spoke at Covenant College on the issue of, um, of, you know, and economics and self-interest and all that. And they just went ballistic, like how in the world, oh no, no, we're, we're always to think about others. We never think about ourselves and, and nonsense like that. And even when you try to explain what, you know, what the terms, they really had a hard time with it because there's just wanting to appear as though they are very respectable too. And you know they want their their you know their graduates to be able to go to the right graduate schools and and that kind of thing, and so um, you know as a result you um, what what you what you see are people really they're willing to compromise and frankly they're willing to compromise the wrong things, and. Um, and they and it, they're also, of course, very much drawn to economic interventionism, precisely because interventionism is about fixing a problem. We have poor people, you know. Uh, InterVarsity. Uh, I don't know if you remember back in 1977, they had a published book by Ronald Sider, "Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger," and it was like if we don't immediately stop capitalism and have the UN run everything and start you know, quit feeding corn to the cows and start shipping all our food to India and all that, that, that poverty is going to get worse and worse and it's capitalism is creating all sorts of troubles and we're going to run out of resources, population's going to explode, you know, that sort of thing. And they just jump feet first into that and... Um, and of course, everything was wrong. You know, they, they didn't get a single thing right. But by the way, they never could admit it. And they still continue. Now it's climate change. And, you know, Christianity Today is just as concerned about climate change as Greta Thunberg, I think. And so, in other words, that to a certain extent, French really appeals to this crowd because um, he's not on the leftist. They know that if they go full. F uh, full-fledged with the left, that they're going to be like sojourners, where, you know, sojourners started out a sort of dissident Christianity, and now they're uh, endorsing polamory and abortion and, you know, and the like. And so they're at that, you know, so they don't want to go quite that route, but David French is this respectable alternative to them. When it's interesting, you even kind of see a little bit of kind of growing backlash and conservative pushback within sort of the, the larger uh, evangelical 
um, associations. In fact, I was watching this week, the first time I've ever really cared about uh, 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 church politics. I'm not even a Baptist, but um, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention um, actually voted overwhelmingly in favor of removing Rick Warren's church uh, for uh, ha having a, a woman pastor and, and sort of the, the, the kind of creeping, kind of pushback against sort of the, the, the creeping sort of progressivism uh, within, within those churches. Um, you know, I think that sort of organizational force backwards is, is something that just is, is interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not seeing quite that with, with my, my own uh, uh, PCA church, uh, uh, but uh, I, I know they, they were also meeting this week, which is very interesting. But, but one of the, um, I, I think that this, this, this larger, you know, given the face of the culture war, this is another one of those of, of interesting dynamics in how um, conservatives seem to either be abandoning um, previously held values or sort of uh, adapting certain, you know, kind of, kind of placating to the left. Um, one of the, the most frustrating things about David French, um, and, and Ryan, you'll appreciate this, is that he has now kind of taken it upon himself to be one of the, the great modern thinkers of classical liberalism. And, and, and you, have, you, you have this sort of, sort of rising uh, appeal to the, the classical liberal uh, label from individuals kind of again, largely kind of using it in their per for their purposes as differentiating them themselves from you know those those nasty evil populists that are guided only by their anger and their hatred of the regime and this is dangerous breakdown of institutions and the like um, and, and yet they have no problem with the use of civil rights uh, powers to, you know, disenfranchise business, you know, uh, you know, businesses with the ability for them to govern themselves in the public square. Um, you know, the, their, their appeals to, to neutrality only tend to send, uh, end up benefiting whoever, whatever the leading power is. And given the, the current state of the country, that is a, a strong uh, leftward bent there. And of course, this entire dynamic of this, this civil rights framework um, you know, there's really nothing classical about that within the liberal tradition. As someone who, who is, is a, a strong defender of the, that, that classical liberal tradition and, you know, the, the work that Ralph Rako has done um, in working the, the Austrian tradition within that and, and obviously uh, uh, Mises' works on, you know, kind of grounding that liberal tradition within property, um, you know, it, it's, it kind of, kind of makes your skin crawl when you see classical liberalism and that tradition kind of, you know, being, being foisted upon the shoulders of individuals like David French, because again, obviously he's had no problem with a, a lititude of, you know, government tyranny and overreach and, and very, very horrible things done under the American regime. And yet here he is lecturing us on what the, 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 the true liberal uh, uh, tolerant way of handling this is when there's really nothing tolerant about those views. Well, here's how the classical liberal grift works. You find the most milk toast, pro regime, uh, ideological thinkers you can from the 18th and 19th century. You, uh, you claim them as yours. And then you can find in their writings uh, support for uh, imperialism, high taxes a robust government, uh, all sorts of state meddling in the lives of people. And you can find people like that under the liberal label from the 18th and 19th century. You can find Alexander Hamilton. Uh, you can find George Washington, who uh, was not particularly good uh, on taxes uh, or uh, just uh, government growth in general. and. So sure, you can then say, oh, well, these are the real classical liberals. But the truth is, if you're a serious historian, you know that the label also includes people like Gustave de Molinari, a radical secessionist and anti-regime person who wanted to privatize the military. The label also clearly includes people like Jefferson. Uh, it includes Bastiat. It includes... Uh, Richard Cobden, who was denounced for opposing uh, the constant warfare of the British Empire and for being a hardcore tax cutter and who was considered a totally not respectable agitator and anti-government uh, activist in the 19th century, who, by the way, orchestrated one of the greatest liberal victories of the 19th century, which was the triumph 
of the Anti Corn Law League, which was the uh, the destruction of the huge taxes on the food supply that the ruling class had imposed uh, for a long, long time. So, yeah. So to 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 claim that classical liberal is like this this term that covers. Uh, these mild, respectable people. Maybe, maybe they were. They're wearing knickers and tri-corner hats. Uh, it's some lame attempt at uh, appealing to authority and knowing that the overwhelming majority of Americans are absolutely clueless about any of this history. They can just say, "Hey, look, I favor Hamilton and Washington, and those other people are too radical, and uh, I've got all those founding fathers on my side." Of course, I could point to plenty of founding fathers that would be considered uh, totally unacceptable and unrespectable by today's standards. Uh, and, I mean, Jefferson, one of them. I mean, any, even co totally ignoring the slavery issue, Jefferson and, Joseph, and his friend Joseph Priestley, who openly supported secession uh, throughout the Western territories of the United States uh, after they added the Louisiana Territory and such. Uh, they would have been considered just crazy people by the standards of David French. Yet they were clearly all liberals uh, and all under that umbrella. Uh, and then, of course, just the, the proper term anyway is liberal, not classical liberal anyway. Uh, but yeah, French is now trying to uh, just create this fake version of history where, yes, we are the, the people who uh, who read books and were intellectual and were understandable, not like any of these radicals who they can't count any of these respectable types among them, uh, which is demonstrably false. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> just be aware that's that's the game they're trying to play. And don't let them get away with stealing the term, by the way. Uh, the usage, I'm not one of these people who thinks that every time the left uses a term, they get it forever. I know people like this. There's a lot of natural defeatists among libertarians and conservative types. So anytime the left appropriates a new term for themselves, like liberal, um, but we could come up with other terms as well, like capitalism. No, never use that term because that's what the left likes to use. Um, no, I don't believe in seeding the field to the left every time they want to rewrite the dictionary uh, to favor them. So I'm not going to stop using these terms correctly. And uh, just because uh, crypto leftist David French wants to do it uh, isn't going to convince yeah. me otherwise. You know something else about French? You have to understand that he, you know, he, he know, now he... He knows how to think like a lawyer to a certain extent, but he's he would not he does not really have the intellectual firepower to be a theorist or somebody you know at that next level. I mean, in other words, he could not be a Murray Rothbard, something like that. Now I'm sure he looks down on Rothbard, but but uh, but the point also is that it's getting his stuff's getting very predictable. Like his column today was going on about how the the old Bill Gothard and all the damage that that he did there and and organized Christianity. And I you know and I would say that Gothard did some damage, but I mean it's it's all it's always going to be a mixed bag. Right after the Nashville shooting, what did he do? Well, he came out with a column denouncing this God and guns, you know, GOP and uh, these folks, these are the ones that are responsible for all of this violence. And I'm thinking, you know something, I doubt that nobody who ever has been and called themselves God, guns and GOP or, you know, had um, or God, guns and Trump or whatever, I doubt any of them went out and shot anybody. Uh, you had a situation where a it's really outrageous. A, you know, trans activist going up and shooting. And by the way, targeting. She was targeting certain people. This wasn't just random shooting. Uh, she went after the pastor. He wasn't in his office. Uh, and so she kills his daughter instead. Uh, this is not, you know, this is not an accident. And uh, a, f a good friend of mine was uh, really the founding pastor of that church and of that school. And he told me, he said it was really creepy watching the video, watching her going into his old office. And she killed a member of his church, by the way. He's, he's a pastor elsewhere now. She killed a member of his church as well, you know, a black fellow. And he, uh, he was the, you know, the caretaker there, custodian. 
And um, so you have this, and what does the Biden administration do? They don't talk to any of the family, the victims. They just kind of give them, well, gee, this is terrible, but it's all about gun control. And we sure don't want, we got to take care of the trans people because I'm sure they're traumatized by all of this. And isn't this terrible for them? And so what ended up happening was that the, the very people who, you know, who were victimized by this were the ones that were being demonized not only by the Biden White House, but then David French comes right along and, you know, he decides to throw dirt on the grave as well. And, you know, I thought that was really outrageous. I mean, what you've got is, you know, there's a lot of violence in that movement and um, that... You know, but because that it's it has official support of the president of the United States and and you know his administration, therefore it, these folks are untouchable. But David French will never ever go into that world because if he does, he knows that number one that all that original opposition that started up when he came to the Times, remember that the the trans and the LGBT people, you know, they all had this open letter and, and whatnot. You can't let him come, you know, to the Times, etc. And so, um, you know, so I guarantee you that he doesn't want to open up that can of worms again. And so that's, uh, so it's just, you know, you're going to see this. It's, it's everybody where, you know, where he was kind of on their side or allied with him, or at least in their subgroup. Now they're the ones that are causing all the trouble. You know, remember after the original indictment, uh, you know, in New York City of Donald Trump, what does he write in a column? He writes, oh, rule of law now depends on the, the right agreeing to, you know, abide by it. And, you know, it's, wait a second. We're lo- what we're looking at is a stacked deck. Uh, that this is really what this stuff is about, you know, that, that especially that original indictment. And I wrote about that. Yeah, I was the one, you know, made the Banana Republic, um, you know, comment about it, that this was an outrage. You know, Trump said, I mean, uh, French wrote, said, oh, well, you know, I have some misgivings about this. This isn't something about misgivings. This is a purely political bill of attainder that the prosecutor managed to get. Oh, yeah, he gets it in, in New York and in, in French is, well, look, Donald Trump will have his day in court. Yeah, I mean, with that kind of a jury, you can imagine what a Manhattan jury, it's like what happened with Martha Stewart. You had people lying to get on the jury just so they could vote to convict her. And uh, so, in other words, what we're dealing with is something really outrageous. And yet, what is what does French do? He turns it back on. Well, if you folks don't go with this, if you are upset about this, you don't believe in rule of law. You're a threat to our country. When it's, it's, it's even played over with some of the culture war stuff. I mean, he's been far more um, harsh to the, the Moms for Liberty group, which uh, just joined uh, LeeRockwell.com on the the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center list of anti-government extremists. So my props to yeah. to all the Moms for Liberties out there for joining good company there. Um, you know, but, but he, he has been far more uh, uh, condemning oh, yeah. of the pushback to, I mean, he, I know he, he published with a, a few other people a defense of CRT curriculums within public high schools, um, you know, saying this is, this is an important for, for our freedom of speech. He's, he identified, you know, child targeted, um, you know, drag queen stories hour as, as you know, the, the blessings of you know, freedom of speech. In America and things like that, you know, it, it's it's the the parents that are very much against having this going on within you know public libraries, public schools, and things like that. Those are the bad guys. Those are the intolerant ones. Um, and yet, you know, the silence on you know the actual actors of the state subsidizing this, promoting this, um, you know, utilizing the levers of power to 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 forward this agenda. Um, and again, it just kind of shows exactly where he has, where, where where he is coming from there. Um, before we we end uh, today's episode, Bill, I wanted to to, to talk about another issue um, that has animated you in the past that you spoke recently about um, at our uh, 
uh, event in Reno, Nevada, um, because I, I think one of the, the sort of cornerstone cam uh, examples of sort of proto Me Too culture, uh, the, the press being weaponized against an easy target. Um, you know, one of the, the very prominent examples of the modern times was the Duke Lacrosse scandal, um, which you did a great amount of reporting on uh, at the time and, you know, really kind of created the playbook, um, even though that ended up unraveling and the students accused were vindicated there. Um, they were very lucky to have that done. You can imagine that in the modern world with the way that social media is so quick to uh, condemn and prosecute in the court of public opinion individuals like that. Um, can you talk a little bit about that case and, and the, sort of the message that you had at our mis recent Mises Circle about that as an example of this larger problem that David French is very much a part of? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, uh, and in fact, of course, the usual suspects, David, I don't think David French was really writing, doing that much back then. But, uh, you know, the usual suspects were outraged at this at first. And then, of course, they started backtracking a little bit um, and, you uh, um, I remember Sojourners, of course, they jumped on it, and Diane Butler Bass, who's sort of in that group with uh, David French, and uh, she said, well, obviously the real problem is with young people and pornography. And I'm thinking, wait a second, we had false charges here. We had the New York Times just making stuff up, and not only the New York Times, but other newspapers and broadcast, Washington Post, just made stuff up. And uh, that it cost, what they had to pay their attorneys, who with the investigators, $5 million in order to, to debunk charges that were just demonstrably false from the beginning. And in fact, that they knew they were false. And see, well, that's one of the issues here that I think that we have to understand, and this goes right into a regime type issue, is that the courts just the way that they're structured, the way that things happen, are set up to automatic belie automatically believe whatever the state actors say. So if the police are lying, the prosecutor is lying, if the judge is in the tank, it doesn't matter because what you have, this is still due process because you've, you're going through all of the trappings of justice. Um, you know, I about... Uh, Four years after the Duke case, I got involved in a trial in my own place uh, with a woman child, charged with child molestation, Tanya Kraft. And I got written up in, you know, not only Reason, but also uh, Pope Hat and some other legal blogs for the work I did there. And uh, and she got acquitted. She actually went to trial, got acquitted, and the DA blamed me for it. And I wrote a column. I started drinking a bunch of red wine, and I got in a real good mood and wrote a column. And told him that I was a blogger and I, I would always have the last word. But, uh, but with the Duke case especially, you're right, what happens when, when you, you know, the state actors are permitted to lie to literally harness the, you know, and harness all of this, this apparatus of so-called justice and push forward? You don't have a choice. You get, you know, you've got to come up with the big bucks to be able to get, the, you know, you know, if you're not in a position of favoritism, you know, after all, these boys were, were, you know, Caucasian. They were, they came from pretty wealthy families. They were Duke, so obviously they were suspect right from the beginning, and they went after them. How do you deal with that kind of a situation uh, when you're caught in the middle of it? And uh, and I'll tell you what, it was very difficult on them. I mean, you know, if we're talking about David Evans' grandfather, he was his heartbroken. He died in the summer of 2006 prematurely. Uh, people were hospitalized. People had, you know, the, the pressure on them was enormous. This was, you know, that everybody seems to think, oh, yeah, they just, these guys just skirted on through. No, they did. They were scarred for life. And, um, you know, one of them, you know, Reed Seligman's done very well for himself since then. He and I keep in touch with each other. And, um, but the, what you have is a situation, frankly, when you can use, when, you, when the media joins forces with the governing apparatus, then it really becomes a, um, 
I mean, it, it, be, it becomes a juggernaut that decent people have a very hard time standing up against. Um, and if you do, you will pay. And like I said, now they got a, they had a, a much deserved settlement with Duke uh, University that took care of the five million dollars and then some. But also, what people for, you know fail to point out is that the prosecutor was able to get his use absolute immunity, so they couldn't sue him. The the Durham police, which oh my God, they just lied, you know, fabricated stuff and uh, did one thing after another. They, too, judges threw that stuff out. Um, families had, families, uh, the other family sued Duke University, and um, they got, uh, Duke got Jamie Gorelick, you know, one of Bill Clinton's old uh, uh, hench, hench women, and, uh, and they just ran roughshod over, you know, over the judiciary on that. You know, judges, oh, now nah, we we'll throw it all out. And that another word, I'll be honest, you know, this is, the thing is always portrayed as a success story. Oh, look, these guys were falsely accused and they were able to get exonerated. Let me tell you what, that the biggest, the people who had the most success were the ones who were the worst actors other than Mike Nifong, the prosecutor. He, you know, he was uh, kind of pushed off into the hinterlands, although he should have gone to prison. And, uh, you know, in a decent society, he would have been charged uh, with, he, he committed a number of felonies during the time. But, um, but the truth was that all the bad actors, they all, you know, on the faculty, they all got promotions. They, um, and uh, Houston Baker went to Vanderbilt, had this, uh, you know, uh, sign chair. And by the way, when he was at Duke, there were very credible sexual assault charges, accusations made against him. Of course, Duke managed to cover that up because he was an African-American professor. They did not want the embarrassment of one of their stars uh, getting, um, you know, getting pulled down like this. And so then Vanderbilt um, gives him a, you know, endowed professorship and lots of money and all that. So that's the backside of it. Is and by the way, and what did Obama do with it? Well, we got the dear colleague letter. This is where the kangaroo court uh, reign of terror gets set up on college campuses regarding the issue of sexual assault. Um, even though nobody said it, I believe it was a direct response to the Duke lacrosse case because a lot of people felt as though we had these guys in our clutches and they got out. We can't let this happen again. And, you know, we got to get that pound of flesh one way or the other. And so, to me, you know, there is no, there's no legacy of the Duke lacrosse case in which the system gets better or that, uh, you know, they said, oh, if these guys, you know, if the charges are dropped, women won't come forward anymore. Well, that was a nonsense. Of course they came forward. They, you know, they can, and a lot of false accusations as well. And you had the universities and the, and the uh, U.S. Department of Education egging this stuff on. So, you know, to be honest, to me that the Duke lacrosse case in the long run ultimately made our justice system worse, and I think it also made the atmosphere on college campuses worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we continue to live in... Uh in, in that world, and uh, don't think the, the David Frenches of the world are going to be the ones uh, fighting the battle against that. Uh, Ryan, do you have any, any closing remarks? Well, I, I, I think I agree with the comment you made earlier, which was just that, uh, who, who's paying any attention to this guy on the right? I, <laughs> clearly an important person as far as the regime yeah. goes, this David French guy goes right like he's he's their current spokesperson just like the other people i mentioned in the past who have who've fulfilled a certain similar role but i don't think french even has much uh influence with conservatism inc you know the basically the the official wing of the conservative movement uh that still pace up pictures of uh ronald reagan on their websites and on their fundraising materials. Usually the people they target are about 75 or older. 
and uh, they all pine for these days of uh, alleged respectable conservatism, which of course is totally ineffective conservatism and <laughs> never won any ideological battles and never really accomplished much of anything. Uh, but that's what they like because it makes them feel civilized uh, to uh, to participate in that stuff. It's it's lots of nice sounding words that they write about each other, and that seems to be what David French is all about. I don't know a single person in real life who's ever mentioned David French except derisively, or or follows the guy in any way. I think if you're a center left reader of New York Times, he seems pretty important to you. Um, and provides also, Milton Friedman also provides a similar uh, a niche here where he allows left-wingers to say, well, even Milton Friedman said. So you can say, well, even David French says. And then they go on to uh, uh, show that their position is actually perfectly compatible with conservatives or libertarians or whatever. Just, you know, Friedman liked... Uh, expansive monetary supply, uh, and he wanted uh, to tax people, quote unquote, more efficiently. And so we, we can do the same sort of thing with French. These people, they, they offer a, a respectable version of the opposition um, that, of course, accomplishes not much of anything, but helps people to feel like they're smart or helps that they can find some sort of agreement in the middle. And uh, beware of those people. They're useless. They don't actually accomplish anything. They're, they're there actually to, um, uh, to prevent people from actually opposing the status quo. And uh, so just be aware that's who we're dealing with, with David French and the people like him. And he'll be replaced soon enough by someone similar who will then fulfill the same role and on we go yeah, from there good point. Okay. kevin williamson was supposed to fill that role another no national review alum until he got uh, quickly axed at the atlantic for um some some very uh, spicy language he used in the past on cultural issues but yeah I, I, well, one one comment to your uh, to that ryan is I, I think one of the things that's interesting and actually i, I think it goes to the project that we have and, and it goes to the point i was making earlier about uh, a French you know, kind of being seen as a kind of the arc classical liberal um, within modern intellectual circles is that in many ways, French's guiding relevance in recent years has been him being used by people like Sarab Amari as a, uh, a straw man for, you know, classical liberalism, for libertarianism. Um, you know, they kind of, of use him as propping him up as who embodies, um, you know, that, that classical tradition. And they, they, they then are, advocate their, their post-liberal project. People like Patrick Deneen fall in this camp, Adrian Vermeule and things like that. And uh, um, Zachary Yost has written a bit about that. Um, uh, some of these, um, though, though Sarab has now also been kind of uh, separated from the, the national conservative movement himself for... For, for it not being uh, sufficiently uh, authoritarian for his his taste, um, but I, I think that's where the kind of the the, the importance of promoting a, a Rothbardian right within the current discourse lies, because you know the the naivete, the the useful you know French playing the role as useful idiot for the left, um, you know that is not a necessary component, and in fact, very much against um, the, the labels that the post-liberal crowd want to target as needing to be destroyed within the current intellectual environment. Um, Oren Cass uh, today uh, released his project for like a new American capitalism um, that is kind of the, the regurgitation of, you know, a, a whole bunch of uh, uh, you know, what Hoffa at one point called national socialist um, economic policies and things like that. And so I, I think that one of the, the missions that we have um, right now, and, and I, I think that, that we do a, a, a darn fine job on this show, um, is kind of promoting that, that Rothbardian, that, that Misesian, that in terms of American co uh, context, the, the, that, that Jacksonian tradition of you know the, the bourbon democrats and the like so that you know you do not have to give up the values and blessings of 
liberalism properly understood, that does not make you a chinless David French, that in fact, this is what is worth preserving within the American tradition. And that if we lose sight of that, it is very easy to become co-opted and, and, and to find the, uh, the, the rejection, the, the, the criticisms that Sarah Bamari has of a David French as being a compelling reason to justify and rationalize all sorts of, of new right authoritarian type projects that you know, it, it is important to, to identify the straw man for what it is and to, um, and, and to, and to, to, to then identify the ways that it is the progressive civil rights state that David French is an, unable to a properly combat that is the underlying problems here and that simply trying to turn a progressive uh, a civil rights apparatus into a theocratic progressive civil rights apparatus is not a, a realistic solution, um, particularly given the, the intellectual makeup of the current elites um, and the very well-financed financial classes and uh, their, their larger aspirations for, for us dear Americans. Yeah, I love these uh, these post-liberal guys who uh, the, the, their basic line of reasoning is liberalism failed, by which they mean everything from like <laughs> John Locke up to, and they include modern social democrats under liberalism. But they say all that failed. So hey, everybody, let's embrace this older ideology from 400 years ago that failed 300 years ago, and it'll work this yeah. time. So that's, that's basically what their whole plan amounts to. They think it counts as great, great insight. Uh, but all they want is just more authoritarian government. So no yeah. thanks. Hard pass. Yeah, you know, one of, the asp one of the dominant themes of progressivism has always been respectability. They sought to make capitalism, you know, you know the economy respectable, you know, with their... You know, entrepreneurs became captains of industry, and uh, the uh, the whole attempt, you know, you know, and and their and their eugenics, everything was aimed at creating this respectable society. Well, that's really what French is. You know, French is still he wants to make all of this respectable, and frankly, that there are times when a little bit of unrespectability is exactly what all this needs. And on, on that comment, I, I don't think we will ever be respectable <laughs> within the halls of the New York Times, but I'd be happy to sit at a table with either of you fine gentlemen and look forward to doing so at Mises U coming up in July. Uh -huh. If you're listening to this show and you want more Mises.org content, you can get a free copy of the Austrian magazine, if that's not already coming to your doorstep, free, physical, uh, yeah, it, it feels good in your hand. We've got a lot of great content. Um, we have a new... Uh, uh, issue coming out very soon, edited by Ryan and Bill. Um, and so you can get yours at Mises.org slash magazine. Uh, for Bill Anderson, for Ryan McMagan, this is The Bishop. This has been Radio Rothbard. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.